But first off, if you're new here, I'm going to introduce myself. My name is Adam, and it is so good to have you worshiping with us if you are visiting today. Let me tell you where we're at right now. We are in a series uh, we've been calling Second Priority, and we're looking at the family. So if we're in a series called Second Priority, that means there's a first priority. Our first priority is what? It's God. So we said in week one that in everything that we do, that we want to make God our first priority. We used a terrible acronym, MGFP, that we would make God our first priority, that in everything we would put him first. That everything that we do, everything that we are, it would be worship unto him. Last week our founding pastor uh, talked about partnership in marriage, so I encourage you if you missed last week and you are married, go back and take a look at that. Two weeks ago, uh, we started uh, this, this message, this is two, two parts this morning of 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn there this morning, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. This is an odd set of scriptures to be talking about when it comes to marriage and the family. I was sitting about four weeks ago having my time with the Lord outside. It was one of the first cold days of the year, or semi-cold days, you could say, here in Florida. And the Lord, as I began to do, read this in my quiet time, just began to speak to me so clearly about this chapter, that this is where God has us right now for such a time as this. Little did I know that the events that have occurred over the past week or so would happen. And it's just so incredible how God speaks to us. And I believe that this, this message this morning has such a burden because I just want to see the, the greater sea church, us, wake up to what God is doing right now in the times that we live in. That we would understand, that we would really understand what God is doing on the earth. So let's read this together right now. We're going to be uh, verse 16. Verse 16, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. It says this, Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing and everything. Give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the spirit. Do not despise prophecies. Test all things. Hold fast to what is good. Abstain from every form of evil. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely and may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved, blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. If you like my notes this morning, you can text notes to the numbers on the screen and what's in front of me will be in front of you. Uh, again, this is part two of this message that I've entitled Unlocking your family's potential. Unlocking your family's potential. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, we come here this morning wanting just you, Jesus. I pray that, Father, you would just speak so clearly through your word to us. Lord, my words are empty without your power, without your spirit. So Spirit, Holy Spirit, would you move in this place this morning, God? Lord, would you fill us up? Lord, I pray that, God, we would receive from you exactly what you have for us and nothing less. God, we live in urgent times. We live in a season, Lord, where your return is coming back so quickly. You're going to return like a thief in the night, Lord. I pray that, God, you prepare our hearts and prepare your church, God. For, Lord, you are holy, God. And, Lord, would you set us apart to live for you, Lord, we would be 100% faithful. We would live 100% faithfully for you, Jesus. Lord, we say to you this morning, would you speak for your servants as listening? God, teach us your ways for we want to know you and we want to find favor in you. We love you. We bless you. We thank you. And everyone said, amen, amen. How many dads in this room have been left alone with your young kids 
when mom went out for a much needed and much deserved girls weekend. Anybody in here, any dads in here? Now, for moms, when the dad leaves, it can be almost easier for them because they know what to expect. They'll plan uh, play dates at the, at the park, and it just is, is easy for them in, in a way. But for dads, what we enter into in that moment when you have young kids, when my kids were two, three, four, I called it survivor mode. Like at that moment, I'm in survivor mode. This might sound really silly to you, but it really, that, that weekend I was in, what I, what I would do is I would uh, go and I'd, I'd buy some paper products because I didn't want to do dishes. I'd get some frozen pizzas, you know what I'm talking about? I'd get some frozen pizzas, I wouldn't prepare because I'm really, I'm not planning to go anywhere for the weekend if Laura's gone. And my kids are two, three, four years old at the time. They're only like a year and a half apart. I'm staying put that weekend and I'm just going to survive. I'm in survivor mode. But what, what is a happening at the house is the house just becomes a little bit of a disaster, honestly. Now, now, nowadays, my kids are a little bit older, and it's not that way, but back when they were two, three, four, five years old, it was survivor mode. The house was a little bit of a disaster. I was hunkering down for the weekend. And, but I would always, right before Laura would come home, I'd want to make sure the house was clean because I wanted to honor her. I wanted to love her in that way. I didn't want her to come home to a, to a dirty home. I didn't want her to come home to a home full of dishes, everything else. So I would make sure I would clean the house right before she got back home. And so I would be texting her, okay, when you, when you're returning, is an hour left, 30 minutes? I don't know. Like, I got to find out. So I make sure I'm cleaning right before she gets home. <laughs> I knew the time that she was coming home. I asked her, when are you coming back home? Here's the thing about this. We don't know when Christ is going to return. But what we have to do is we have to get our home and our family in order. We don't know when he's returning, but I'm telling you this morning, he's returning quickly. He's returning like a thief in the night. And we as the body of Christ, we as people, there's a call this morning for us to get our family and our homes in order, church. No longer can we mess around. Like this is the last 30 minutes right before Christ returns. Like now is the time to get things in order. And in this chapter, this is Paul's plea with the church of Thessalonica that Jesus is returning soon. And because of this, he makes these therefore statements. He says, therefore, live in peace. Therefore, comfort one another. And then in verse 12, he says, I urge you, so he takes it a step further, I urge you. So we gave three things last week in which he was urging the church to do. But let me read this real quick. 1 Thessalonians 5, 1 through 5, it says this. But concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no idea that I should write to you. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, so this day should be taken as a thief. You are all sons of light and sons of the day. We are not of the night nor the darkness, therefore. What is therefore talking about? Therefore is talking about Christ, because because Christ is returning soon, therefore do these things. I said earlier, therefore don't be asleep. Therefore, comfort one another. So three things I gave you last week that were keys to unlocking your family's potential. The first one I gave you was comfort one another. The second thing I gave you was build one another up. The third thing was to live in peace. So I want to give you three more things this morning to unlocking your family's potential. But you could also say that these, this is the will of God for your life. How many of you want to know the will of God for your life? I want to know the will of God for my life. We can get there in a moment. But let me expound a little further about where I believe we really are in the end of days. And this is not truth, but this is what I believe. And I just pray that, man, it urges you on to begin to think about this. I really do believe that the spirit of the Antichrist has been released where we're at in, in our time, in the season, in our generation. You can see lawlessness, a spirit of lawlessness moving rampantly amongst governments and amongst nations 
where they're coming against nation against nation. We know this. And what I believe is these conflicts that are happening, Russia, Ukraine, Israel, Hamas, and really Iran. You have China and Taiwan that are right around the corner, it seems like, to be going to war. Other nations that are talking about war. What this is leading to, I firmly believe this. I'm not saying this to scare you this morning. I believe it's really leading to World War III. And out of World War III, I believe that then at that point, the Antichrist is going to give room for him to come into power for one world government. I really do believe this because what is the Antichrist going to bring? According to scripture, he's going to bring peace. Where there was no peace, he's going to bring peace. So out of World War III, he's going to bring peace. So you might be saying, Adam, why are we talking about this in a marriage series? Again, because we live in an urgent day to get our, our families in order. And what's exciting about this is God has chosen us to live in this generation for such a time as this. And what we get to experience really is, is, is so unbelievable because God says in his last days, he's going to pour out his spirit upon all flesh. His sons and daughters will prophesy. Young men will dream dreams and old men will see visions. You see, in the middle of everything that's happening going on, the church, the body of Christ, when we live fully devoted, 100% faithful to him, no matter what's going on around us, like we can have peace and we can have joy that doesn't make sense to the rest of the world. Like we can have more joy and more peace than we've had in our entire lives because we're understanding that we're getting this, the glory of God in our generation in a way that we've never experienced before. Like we're gonna experience a revival and outpouring of his spirit, not just here at Journey, but the greater seat church in general. I really believe that and we get to experience that. And so there's nothing to be scared of, there's nothing to be afraid of, for if anything at all, it's just a call to say, man, I need to live completely 100% faithful to give my entire uh, being to the Lord and to live for him. It's a call for that, and then out of that, man, everything's going to work itself out. You feel me this morning? That in everything, all of it will be worship unto God, that we would put him as our first priority. All of it. So there's an urgency now for us to live in our biblical roles. There's an urgency for men to be the spiritual leads of their family. There's an urgency for moms to create a nurturing, loving environment in a way that only they can. There's an urgency for sons and daughters to honor your father and mother for this is right. And it will go, what's the promise? It's one of the greatest promises in all of scripture that it will go well with you and you'll have a long life. And I mean this, it doesn't matter how old you are, how young you are, it doesn't matter. Like that promise is for everyone. And we need that promise in the generation that we live. But not only that, we need to know the will of God for your life. What is the will of God for your life? Let me tell you what it's not. The will of God for your life is not for you to be rich, not for you to be famous, not to have a YouTube channel that goes viral and is a ministry. The will of God for your life is not even for you to be a pastor or a worship pastor. The will for God of your life is not for your business to succeed. Those are all good things. Some of those are good things. And I believe that the Lord does call us to do good works, but the will of God for your life is found here in verse 16. The will of God for your life is this, to rejoice always, to pray without ceasing, and to give thanks in everything. That's the will of God for our life. When we understand the will of God for our life, that even in the middle of what is happening in the world, and we can have anxiety from what's happening in the world, we we can reject that and say, man, I'm going to lean into the will of God, which is to rejoice always, to pray without ceasing, and to give thanks in everything. To give thanks in everything. So let's look at this a little bit deeper this morning. Let's look at these three things. So let's read this together. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. So let's dive into number one this morning. Uh, The number one key to unlocking your family's potential 
and the, really the will of God for your life. Number one, rejoice always. God's will for you is to rejoice always. Hit your neighbor right now and say rejoice. Rejoice, rejoice always. Come on, tell them rejoice always. Rejoice. Philippians 4.4 says this, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Now imagine growing up in a home where there is no joy. It's filled with fighting, backbiting, complaining. Some of you grew up in a home like that. But did you know that you can break that cycle in your family? And in your own family, you can create a legacy of joy because you're choosing joy in the middle of everything that's happening and going on. Listen to this. A joy-filled heart makes a joy-filled home because joy flows from the inside out, not the outside in. You see, joy is a choice and it is an easy thing to choose, but yet it's so hard to choose all at the same time. A joyful home is not made in one decision at the beginning of the day. It's made by moment, by moment, by moment, moment. You're going to choose joy. How many are going to choose joy in all things? Come on, church. We're going to choose joy in everything. So what does it look like in Psalm 118 when it says to rejoice and be glad in it? What does it look like inside our families to do this? I want to give you four practical things, four practical tips to having joy in your home. Number one. It's very practical. Fill the home with laughter. Fill the home with laughter. Proverbs 17, 20 says this, a joyful heart is good medicine, but a crushed spirit dries up the bones. Be as consistent with joy and with laughter in your home as you are with discipline with your kids. It's important to laugh. It's important to bring joy into your home. And so though joy certainly doesn't require laughter, there is still something, isn't there something truly life-giving about laughter in your life and laughter in your home? So first practical thing is laugh often and laugh with, with, with your family. Number two, read God's word as a family every single week. Make God's word a part of your daily, weekly routine within your family. Just as you eat and sleep, make it a part of your daily routine, weekly routine. Number three, Show affection continually. The third practical way to have joy in your home is to show affection continually. Hug one another. <laughs> Kiss one another. Parents, model for your kids what it's like to be affectionate. Hold hands in front of them, right? Now, just a side note for, for just a moment, all right? So, make... Make sex a normal thing within your family. In other words, talk about it with them. Because if they don't hear it from you, they're going to hear it from the world. And so talk about it. Make it a beautiful, God-given thing. It's a gift from God between a husband and a wife. And make it that way. Make it a beautiful, wonderful thing in the context of marriage. Because they don't hear it from you, they're going to hear it from the world. I, uh, we recently, about a year ago or so, talked to our kids that are now... 11 and 12, Laura talked to Ruth and I talked with Caleb. And so what I did with, with Caleb, I took him to, to Five Guys. We got burgers, we got fries. It's our favorite place to go uh, as buddies. And, and, and so we sat down and took a couple bites for a burger. I said, buddy, man, I want to talk to you about something. And begin to have the conversation about the birds and the bees with him. But what I had is I had scripture of just what the God's word says about sex and how beautiful and wonderful it is. So I began to walk him through what it looks like biblically. And one thing he was, when I was beginning to talk about it with him, at one point he has his hands over his face like this. <laughs> and he just turns pale white. And I just began to say, explain to him, buddy, this is a beautiful thing within marriage, but this is something you need to know. And so make I just want to make the point, make affectionate normal in your, in your family. It's important to do that. The fourth thing, play and have fun. This is important to do within your, within your home, play and have fun. You know, Laura always says to me, I want to make our home a place where our kids just want to hang out and hang out with their, with their friends. 
you know, find time every single week to get together with family, just gather. This past week, uh, our family, uh, we, played, uh, we played aggravation together. And it's just a simple time just getting together and hanging out and, and having joy, play, playing with one another. And of course, uh, luckily, I was pretty happy about it anyways. I shouldn't be so happy about it, but, but uh, Ruth and I won, so that's, that's, that's pretty cool. Like, I'm, I'm okay with that. But hey, make time to, to play and to, and to have fun. Make time to, to enjoy one another. Let's go to the next key to unlocking your family's potential. Pray without ceasing. Pray without ceasing. Ephesians 6.18. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. We said in week one that 50% of marriages, whether Christian or non-Christian, sadly end in divorce. I read another statistic this week that if couples attend church, then it actually drops into half. And 26% of marriages that where they attend church will end in divorce. The next stat that I found this week was this, that one in 1,500 marriages will end in divorce if they pray together. One in 1,500. That's taking, that's point. Oh, oh, six percent of marriages will end in divorce if you pray together. Like, you've got to know that's a key in your marriage. That is a key in your marriage. If, if you want a healthy marriage, if you want to connect with your spouse, that is the best way to do it. Because what happens when you're praying together is really, honestly, it's one of the most vulnerable things that you can do with your spouse. It will connect you in a way that nothing else can. Because what happens is you're connecting your soul with their soul and with the heart of God. And what do we know? That a a three-stranded cord cannot easily be broken, right? And so when you come together with your spouse and you begin to pray and invite God in the middle of that, there's a coming together that cannot easily be broken. Isn't that amazing that 0.006% of marriages win a divorce if you pray together? Like that's taking... Uh, this, that only happens if there's an anomaly, uh, anomaly happening. Like that, that's overwhelming stat that if you pray together, it brings you together in a way that nothing else can. But one thing is that praying together is a very vulnerable thing, is it not? It can be hard for some people. And, you know, my journey uh, in praying with, with Laura, it, it never was, for us anyways, it never was awkward when we actually begin to pray together, but it's still a little bit difficult to get started, if I'm honest with you. It's still a little bit difficult to, to begin to pray. So like, here's the thing about this too. The enemy would do everything he possibly can to stop couples from praying together. Like if you set aside a time, I'm gonna be praying with you, know that the enemy is gonna to try to attack you right before you're gonna be praying together. And so you gotta be mindful of that. Know, knowing that the enemy is going to try to come against you to stop you from praying with your spouse. Uh, two weeks ago, Laura and I, we set aside a time that we knew that, that we needed to pray for something very specific in our life. And I knew that we needed to go to war together over this. And so we said, okay, it was on Saturday. Once these things get out of the way and right before this happens, let's set aside 30 minutes and let's pray together. Well, what happened right before we started praying together, honestly, like, the enemy just started coming against our attitude towards one another. And to be honest with you, I was trying to control situation, and I was being prideful in a moment. And it was really my fault. And I said to her, do you not recognize, do we not realize what the enemy's trying to do? He's trying to hinder us from praying together right now. And so we recognized that and we dropped our pride, dropped the arrogance inside of us and we just said, okay, we're going to pray together right now. And so we ended up praying together and we ended up getting breakthrough and victory in that area. But one thing you got to know is when you schedule a time to pray together if, and it's very specific to go to war over something, you got to know that the enemy might come and attack you. So be aware, be on your guard. But I encourage you, man, find, find a time that you're praying with your spouse every single week, every single day. 
Find that time to connect. It will connect you in a way that nothing else can. It's the most intimate thing that you can do in a marriage. I really do believe that. It's the most intimate thing you can do in a marriage. I want to give you a couple practical ways for you to praise a couple. Number one, pick a time and place that you want to pray together. Remember, be purposeful with this. Be intentional with this. Number two, agree it's okay to remind one another when it's time to pray. Because you might feel like, oh, you're super spiritual. Why are you reminding me to pray? Like, there's a couple that sometimes can get that way. But remind each other, okay, let's remind one another it's time to pray. It's okay to do that. Number three, as you're getting started, it's okay to pray silently with one another. It's okay to pray silently. Number four, write out a prayer list. Think about things that you need to intercede for, intercede for your family, write out a prayer list. Number five, don't judge each other. This is really important. Don't judge each other if you miss a scheduled prayer time. Amen? Amen. Don't judge each other if you miss a scheduled prayer time. Just get right back on the next day. So be a family of continual prayer. Be a person of prayer. This leads me to number three. The third thing to unlocking your family's potential is give thanks. Give thanks. 1 Thessalonians 5.18. In everything, give thanks. You know, we often forget how good we have it with our spouse. We often forget how good we have it in our lives in general, and we take things for granted. But, you know, I find it really interesting that the Bible oftentimes give is right before thanks. So in other words, thanks is not a feeling, it's something that we give. It's a choice that we make. So what do we do? We give thanks. Let me give you some examples in scripture. First Chronicles 16.34, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His love endures forever. Psalm 7, 17, I will give thanks to the Lord because of his righteousness. I will sing the praises of the name of the Lord most high. Psalm 104, enter his gates with thanksgiving and in his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. Daniel 6, 10, three times a day he got down on his knees and prayed. Three times a day he got down on his knees and prayed. Just notice that. Giving thanks. Matthew 14, 19, taking the five loaves and two fish, looking up to heaven, he what? He gave thanks. He gave thanks. So it's not a feeling of thankfulness. The power is in the giving of it, the expressing of thanks. Giving thanks is what allows our heart, perspective, and attitude to change. We often forget to thank God for our family and have a a perspectful, a, a, a perspective of thankfulness. But may we have a perspective of thankfulness for our family, for our wife, for our kids, for our spouse. Often we get stuck in a rut in our marriage and what happens because we've become complacent in our relationship. But if we just chose in a moment just to give thanks for what God has given us, it would change our perspective completely. When my kids, Laura does this with my kids, when they have a... Uh, a bad attitude, and they're just in a, a fighting stage uh, in the car or whatever it might be. Laura will turn to them and say, you have to give me three things right now that you're thankful for, Ruth. If Caleb's in a bad attitude, Caleb, give three things that you're thankful for, Ruth, about. If Ruth's in a bad attitude, Ruth, give three things you're thankful for, Caleb, about. And what ends up happening is before the whole thing's over, they end up laughing it's just changed their whole perspective. You know, laughing about the things they're thankful for, being to realize, man, at the beginning, yeah, it's really, really hard, but then once they give the three things, they think through it, it just changes their whole entire perspective. That we have to choose to what? To give thanks. When you say that, give thanks. Give thanks. That we would be a people that give thanks in everything. In everything. So what is this all about? What is Paul writing to the church of Thessalonica? What is, what is he really saying? And I believe that he's saying to us right now. Christ is returning soon. Christ is returning so quickly. 
And we've got to get our families and our lives in order, that we would be a church that lives 100% faithful to our God. That's no longer time to mess around. It's no longer time just to go through the motions with our relationship with God, that we would understand that we need to live set apart, that we'd understand that we would live holy lives, that we'd understand that we need to live in the will of God. What is the will of God? To rejoice always to pray without ceasing, and to give thanks. That that would be the people of who we are. God is calling us to rise up because there is a battle and there is a war. Do we really understand it? Do we really get it? Do we see the, the times and the signs of the times? And may we really take that to heart and may we live it out in our everyday life. As Paul wrote to them, urgently, 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 urgently. Let me end with this, verse 19. This is not going to be on the screen. Do not quench the spirit. These are things to help us navigate these times in which we live. Do not quench the spirit. How many know we need the spirit of God to move freely? We need the spirit of God to move freely. How many just want the spirit of God to move freely? Come on, do you really desire the Spirit of God to move freely in this place? Do not quench the Spirit. Do not despise prophecies. Listen to this. This is really important right here. Test all things. Test all things. Hold fast to what is good. Abstain from every form of evil. A church, again, a call to holiness. And now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely and may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful, who also will do it. Listen, we serve a faithful God and he is going to sustain us in the times in which we are walking into. We live in the most exciting generation on the face of the planet, the face of, of history. This is the most exciting time. If you sense it and you know it, would you stand to your feet right now? This is the most exciting time in history in which we live. It is a call to live set apart, to live holy, to be completely, fully devoted to Him.